everyone. Welcome to How We Innovate at Arizona State University. My name is Brent Siebel. I'm with my co-host, as always, Michael Hool from Hool Curry Law. Yeah, great to be here. Happy to be here again today. Oh my gosh. It's like we have so much fun together. We have the most amazing <laughs> human beings that come in yeah. to this, uh, this amazing studio we have here at the Tempe campus in uh, Arizona. Uh, I'm a part of the IRA Fulton Schools of Engineering. And we do some pretty cool things in the world of technology entrepreneurship. And this uh, series is one of those things. We also have a brand new, well, not brand new anymore. We're fully launched, built. We have uh, great graduate students in our Master's of Science in Innovation and Venture Development. And two of the student founders that make up our third cohort of that program are here with our guest, Kendra Flom Parat, who you'll meet uh, very soon. But... I'm going to start with our, our first student uh, panelist on our on our podcast, our video series here. Uh, Aspen is with us. She is the founder, co-founder, you tell me. Uh, she is doing data-driven hospitality, which is super cool. Yep. So tell us uh, about your, your company and what are you guys up to right now? Yeah, of course. So my company is called Gatsby's. My name is Aspen Gats. So we do... <laughs> matching personally, professionally, platonically, and romantically within entertainment experiences. So our intention is to combine what takes, uh, what is working with the different dating and networking apps, as well as what's wonderful with different entertainment experiences, and bringing them together in order to solve this epidemic of disconnect that is truly existing in our society today. So we're very excited. We're fundraising right now, and awesome. things are going yeah. well. That sounds Thank very you. cool. Yeah, Thank very you so cool. much. Thank you for being here. Yeah, congrats on... Uh, changing the world for the better. I mean, that's what we're all about here at the university and to have you part of our ecosystem of change makers is, is fantastic. And so you have a, you. Uh, a colleague here, Isaac is with us, one of our founders within the MSIBD program. So yeah. Isaac, thanks for joining us today. Glad to be here. You are changing the world of uh, foam. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I started a food and beverage company that's focused on <clears throat> developing innovative food and beverage products. Um, and our first kind of who were targeting is coffee shops. And um, I was a barista at Starbucks for three years, so I got to experience a lot of the problems firsthand that come with working in a cafe. And um, so the product that we're developing first is a called Foam. It's a ready-to-use cold foam product. Very cool. So foam spelled like home because yeah. you were using it in the home. Yeah, Yeah. eventually we, we plan to, to branch out to CPG products. What, we're, 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 what stage are you at right now? Like, what's your company Develop, doing? Yeah, so we're developing, like, the recipe and, and okay. formulated, formulating it for, like, uh, production okay. right now. So. Got it. A lot more science behind uh, developing something like that than I thought, you know? Yeah, because <laughs> you've already developed it uh, for yourself, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. so now it's how do you tweak the recipe so that it can stay on the shelf or right. it can be, yeah. you know, scaled, new, you know, in the, yeah. in the lab. Or, like, producing it at a level that, restaurants can purchase it from and or quickly enough <laughs> yeah nice you actually have some foam on your beard oh, you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's too good. <laughs> you should it just looks like he came from work yeah you know? exactly yeah. <laughs> i was taste testing again in yeah. The lab. uh yeah you know i i just read got, you know the the milk industry is uh making a push to your generation uh we grew up hearing the tagline got milk yes so the with, new one's going to be... With the milk mustache. Yeah, yeah, yeah the milk mustache. Yeah. Got foam yeah. is yeah. the new, yeah, there, there, is the there new tagline yeah. <laughs> for humanity. So anyway, Michael, we are super excited to have my dear friend and uh, long-time... Long-time. Um, <laughs> long-time uh, go-to person in the world of uh, hospitality and entertainment and food service here in the Valley. But she got her start right here uh, at Arizona State as an undergraduate I believe business major. I, I did. I thought I wanted to be a teacher. Oh, okay. So you, you well, pivoted I, I to business. I, I quickly went to business. And now yeah. it's, you know, you're paying dividends uh, a couple, <laughs> couple of years later. Uh, but uh, Kendra is uh, a, a fantastic uh, business owner, uh, mover and shaker here in the Valley of the Sun. And so we're super excited to have her uh, with us today. So Kendra, do you mind kind of telling your story as it relates no, from being it feels you know, like here a long on story. <laughs> well, I mean, just the, you know, the, the fast forward sure. version, but I, I know there's a lot of people in our audience that will really um, get excited to hear your story because it's, it's, it's quite common for our students to go one way and then change course. 
uh, and uh, to, to have your example as a guide, I think it's going to be really uh, powerful. Sure. I, um, like I said, I'm from Ohio, went to ASU, thought I wanted to be a teacher. And looking back now that I have kids, I, I could never have done it. <laughs> they are superheroes. It is a hard job. We've it's been true. very lucky. The kids have been very lucky to have some amazing teachers, but I, I honestly, that wasn't my passion and I, I don't think that was my um, strong suit. Mm -hmm. So I quickly changed to purchasing and logistics, mm -hmm. which is now supply chain management. Over the time I was at ASU, it changed and um, started at ASU. So I worked, uh, I did some volleyball coaching and I worked in a restaurant, El Paso Barbecue in Scottsdale and I started as a host. So I started as a host got promoted to server, and then from there moved to the Awatuki location and became a bartender. And in that time, I think that's where my passion started. I'd never worked in a restaurant, and I felt that I truly, I loved the hustle and bustle, and it teaches you to deal with difficult people. It really does. It teaches you teamwork. It teaches you um, not to get overwhelmed. <laughs> what? No, I was nothing. I wasn't, I wasn't indicating you were a difficult person at all. A difficult person. <laughs> So from there, um, I did that for a long time, and I felt that I should get some business experience. So I went to do a small internship at Insight, pretty much sat and did research on their um, on their products, pricing, competitors, all that. Insight is a, a valley-based technology yes, company, yep. uh, hardware, yep. software, that sort of thing. And it was summer internship. Then from there, I did an internship with Apollo Group, which was the... Um, Corporation of University of Phoenix at the time. Mm. I don't believe they are anymore. And I worked in their telecommunications department. So that was my first really business internship inside an Apollo group. Anything to do with telecommunications. So head, headsets, telephones, pagers. Not sure if you know what a pager is. <laughs> um, pretty much we dealt with everything for that corporation. So from there, I was still working at the restaurant, still loved doing that. And in um, 2000, I graduated from ASU. I, the experience was amazing, teachers, classes, everything was amazing about it. I loved ASU and it taught me, I was able to use everything I learned in my internships and then on to my next career, which was Intel. So mm. you would think I went to a restaurant. I did not. I went to <laughs> Intel and started as I was, uh, I was brought on as a buyer for the factory. So at the time, Fab 12 was operating. Fab 6 in Chandler was a small facility they were operating, and I was in charge of pretty much keeping tools running, inventory management, risk assessment, forecasting, cost savings, all that. Right out of college. Right out of college. Wow. Yeah. Um, That's impressive. The exciting part was they were ramping up Fab 22. Fab 22 was their new, invent, their new factory. That was complete, like, here's the operations, I'm learning to do this, I'm also ramping up a new factory where you don't want to be the reason that it doesn't, the tools don't work, that they, they, you don't want to be called in by the tool owner because you didn't do your job. So we had our bill of materials, and we were strict, just ramping up. Get it here, get it here, no matter what. Whereas then the operation side of Fab 12 was, you know, cost savings, make sure you are... Um, not holding anybody up, but also make sure you're forecasting properly and um, dealing with communicating to the tool owners. And I was also a backup for chemicals and gases for the factory, which was, um, I was just a backup. So when they were on vacation, it's interesting to not just be in charge of the set of, of equipment and tools, it's chemicals and gases run through the whole factory. So I was able to see that world also. And I did that for four years. I ended up as a program manager. Uh, I was able to utilize everything I learned uh, somehow, you don't think that everything will apply, but it really does um, once you're firsthand trying to deal with contract negotiations and meeting new people, vendor assessments and all that. And so did that for four years. And in 2004, my family, we have uh, had owned two restaurants. So the Old Town Tortilla Factory, and we owned a Teak Woods in Scottsdale. And they wanted to expand to a third location, just a different, not the same um, a different, we weren't quite sure what it was at the time. They just wanted to see if I was in. And I felt that I loved Intel. It was a great company, but that wasn't my passion. My passion wasn't, um, wasn't mm -hmm. business, corporation, that kind of thing. So 
I said yes, and from there it's it's not a you know tomorrow you give your notice and you're done. You you have to look at different. We were looking at different um, locations. We were looking at we thought do we open a brand new one, start over, mm -hmm. build it, or do we take an existing restaurant? And I felt that we felt my family felt that the existing restaurant was better for us because you have location already, you have customer base, you have staff, you have sales, and you can build off that. So we definitely decided that was our best route. We had a restaurant broker that helped us find different locations. Nothing fit until all of a sudden it did. And I gave my notice. They had already known I was leaving. I made sure to leave on good terms because we all know the risk of restaurants, just owning your own business in general. Right. Yeah. But I think they say, you know, 80% fail within five years mm -hmm. if you don't have the capital and all that. So that was risky for me to leave a corporate job. So I left on good terms, and um, off I went to Bar None in Ahwatukee. So Bar None in 2004, July of 04, that was what it was existing, and didn't really fit with what we wanted our brand to be, our new brand to be. But we also, our business plan was not to just walk in and change everything. Our business plan was to get to know the customers, get to know the staff, get to know the the neighborhood, Awatuki, and get to know everything that was important to make a decision and also knowing what obstacles we would be facing. So that was also, um, in that time, we did our research on uh, liquor laws. And long story short, it was 60-40 percentage. We were dancing around the percentage and we had a restaurant license. And the, the concern was if the liquor board made us get a, a liquor license, which is the, the six. It's about a hundred thousand dollar license just to get it, and that they're not always available. So we luckily um, questioned that during our negotiation and had money in escrow from both sides, holding it in there for that first year to ensure that if they did come in, we wouldn't be out a hundred thousand dollars. And um, that was one of the things that we had planned on in that time frame. And also um, at that time, you could smoke in restaurants. You could smoke anywhere inside. And we knew that was coming down the ropes of not happening soon, and there was no patio. So those were some two big things that we, that right away, had to pay attention to, um, which are business changing. I mean, money-wise, um, operations-wise. And so that first six months, we, like I said, did our research, talked to everybody, and then January of 05, created CKs, which was our brand, um, for Chad, my brother, and I'm Kendra. So... Unfortunately, the know. joke is the logo. It's the big C and the little K. I couldn't get the K bigger. Uh, it just worked out in the logo. But um, I was... To talk he, to that graphic designer. Right, yeah. right? <laughs> I love people over there. Um, so he, he stayed at Tortilla Factory full-time. We had the Teakwoods, and then I was full-time at CK's. And from there, um, we, we started a new... We started everything new. We had similar menu, but drink, drink specials, patio we re we redid all the tvs i mean we really just refaced all of the inside and added the patio which was huge because that also is a sales increase the struggle on that was the location had very limited <clears throat> parking and then to put a patio in and to take more parking that was probably a, a very hard thing uh, we had to get that approved but to decide to do that it was definitely worth it needing those extra sales and you're in arizona like you have to have a patio and we knew it would go to non-smoking eventually inside. So those were some big things we did. So January of 05, grand opening. And from there, worked a lot, <laughs> especially at the beginning. It was before I had my son. And I was, you know, anyone owning a business knows, like, it's not just when you want to work. It's really a lot of time to put in. And especially at a restaurant, you know, Football season, someone had to be there at 7 because football games start at 9, and you're open till 2 a.m. I mean, you're really there wow. close to 24 hours, plus someone's cleaning in between. Like, it, you know, my phone would ring all night hmm. for whatever reason. Um, so it was exciting, 17 and a half years. That, that was what pretty much what we put into it in that time. Can I pause you for a yeah. second? I wanted to ask you a question related to the transition when, once you, you know, acquired it. So it was a different concept. It was. Right? And so you changed the concept mm -hmm. totally. Totally. <laughs> okay. So what did you do? Or, or I'm, I'm not familiar enough what you have to do, but 
um, to try to keep the customers that were local going to that restaurant yep. and everything changes, do you just, you know, bank on the fact that if, even though it's a totally new concept, if we have high quality food and the prices are right, they'll still come anyway? I mean, how does that work? Yes, but that's where we decided the six months was the perfect time to get to know them. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't just running the restaurant and that I was sitting with customers and let me tell you, when you buy a restaurant and they've been coming there, because it was a famous Sam's before that, mm -hmm. they tell you how long they've been there, so. where their seat is, <laughs> don't take like don't take this off the menu, <laughs> anything like that. So yeah. I really just, it was more of the personal relationship. Mm -hmm. So they didn't freak out. I got to know as many people as I could. I spent so much time talking to families and talking to people um, what they liked and didn't like. So that was how I got them to stay because a sports bar is a sports bar. I mean, you have five within a two mile radius of where we were. Um, we were, you know, we considered ourselves a neighborhood sports grill, but like that is the fear of someone comes in and changes yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. That's why we waited. If we would have walked in in July of 04 and flipped a switch right there, they would have felt that they weren't appreciated and heard. And we made sure that they felt heard and appreciated. Mm -hmm. Got it. Love that story. We teach this idea of customer development, really kind of getting beyond the, you know, the survey or the suggestion box and really getting to know who it is that you're helping with your innovation. So uh, to hear that that happened soundingly very organically, just out of your own initiative, um, is a we reason. We didn't really have an option. I mean, at some point we felt like the risk was too high to just go in shoulders, chest puffed and mm -hmm. say, this is what we're doing. Um, we felt that that, that well, was our option, I'm right? pretty confident there are some business owners that have gone down that route and ha might not have had the same outcome that you had. So give yourself some credit, for sure. <laughs> Remember, there's that 80% failure rule, and I think a big uh, percentage of that percentage is probably because they ego got in the way. And that's what you know we talk about with uh, early-stage innovators, to be open to and listen. Listen, what the listen, market listen, really yeah. wants. So yeah. how different was this to your existing two restaurants? Um, it's completely different than the Old Town Tortilla Factory. That's Southwest Cuisine, um, Berry. I mean, sports bar kind of says it. It's different. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely. That's a patio <laughs> I mean, and great, yeah. you know, um, just, I won't say better food, different quality of food. Um, the people who travel to Arizona, the patio is amazing. It's yeah fire fountain and it's just yeah. a beautiful mm -hmm. location and so that's a destination place for people who come into town and also just people who just want to sit outside or yeah. want to enjoy the the southwest food the teak woods was similar but it wasn't our brand we had oh. you know taken over someone else's brand at the time and we wanted to brand our own um our own restaurant so similar yet completely okay. different <laughs> did those customer interviews like help you develop your, your business idea or like what it evolved into i would say it helped us know what to keep yeah. what they liked it did give us some ideas on what they were i mean like some of the things they'd ask for i'm like that that's not possible to stay in yeah. business but at some point you know they wanted specials and they wanted um they wanted to help the community because a lot of the times i'm well i'm really big on community outreach i've always been that way I'm still now that I'm I'm sorry to pop to the story of now that I sold it, we'll get there. But I um, that's always just been something that we do. We you know we do wish trees and we do school donations and we do we, um, special fundraisers when people are having health problems and blood drives and that was something big to me. And pe the customers actually said that too. Like we're hoping you use your platform to help the community, and that was something that I had already really liked doing. And so it was great that the customers wanted yeah. a way to get involved, too. So continue the story, but I love this track you're on. Um, tell us about how you built the culture of CKs as a, as a brand, as a company. Um, you can employees. tell I'm super shy. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't like to talk, and I'm super shy. But no, I, I find myself a people person. And I have always, I felt like when I was at El Paso, you know, they took care of the people. Intel was very people oriented. Um, Arizona or the AZ Fab Materials Department took care of its people. It just, I've kind of learned that that's how you get loyalty. That's how you get commitment. That's how you get hard work mm -hmm. is to, to 
give back to your people and to put something into them that is not just monetary, like we had talked about, is just you you can throw money at people, but it's it's they need to feel cared for. And at some point, that is why I think we succeeded is because of our people. I say that I've said that forever, and probably any article that was written, you know, on the during the CKs or after, like it was the people. Like that was the reason we were still there that long. I had um, an amazing staff. They cared about the place, um, but even the people, the customers too, they felt cared about. So it was like a cheers. I know, I know that's a lot of people say that that really is, um, it is a thing. It is a thing. Yeah. People felt like they came in and they knew about, I knew about their families and I knew their kid had a sports meet the day before and I knew that, you know, so-and-so yeah. lost their job or, you know, a family member, something happened health-wise. Like, it was a family and that's where I think that we were the most successful is, I cared about my employees, they cared about me, and it was a family. And I think that no matter what business you're in, it's the people mm -hmm. that matter. And I've always said it, and I still believe it to this day. It's amazing. So, um, where was I in my story? In general, started the operations, and yeah. we a lot had happened over that time. You know, we I learned a lot of lessons. I was 26 when we um, bought Bar None. And I could say I was na naive. <laughs> How did you fund your growth? Was it organically getting that going? It, or did you take in any account? We took out a bank loan. Okay. Yeah, we took out a bank loan. And the biggest thing for restaurants is they told us, you know, your business plan, most restaurants will fail because you think you just need to get started. But it's the capital of a restaurant. Most restaurants aren't profitable for the first two years. So you have to ensure that you have the capital to keep going and, you know, Arizona is Arizona. Summer, it's hot. Yeah. People go out of town. People travel. Um, so you're going to have a downtime. And our uptime was March. And, you know, mm -hmm. when people came to visit, it's also football season. You know, we're a sports place. So any, you know, it was great when Suns or Cardinals or Coyotes, someone did <laughs> yeah. well. And it was few and far between yeah. in that time period yeah. we had. Yeah. But um, in general... We had a lot of ups and downs. We started out, you know, we our sales just skyrocketed. People loved the concept. They loved the patio. They loved um, the neighborhood feel and the giving back and, and knowing that I was there a lot and had my pulse on everything. You know, and as the 17 and a half years and I had um, my son and I had my stepdaughter, we, you know, I'm very involved in their life. So I wasn't always there after that, but I was always had my hands on something to make sure that it still felt that way. I wanted it, when I wasn't there, I wanted it to feel like I was there. Um, yeah. So tell us what happened just within the last few years. Uh, you already gave away the grand finale. You I know, I know. Uh, so congratulations Thank you. on your Thank exit. You. Thank you. Thank um, you. But, but yeah, what, what, it, was there any kind of uh, you know, moment that you felt like, okay, I've done everything I wanted to do with this? <laughs> there are a few of those. <laughs> well, so what did you sell? All restaurants or no, just the just one? CKs. Okay. Yep. Got just it. the one. We had actually sold teak woods in 2009. Oh, that was okay. just one that my brother was at Tortilla Factory. I was at CKs, and there was no one really committed in yeah. there. Mm -hmm. And um, we just decided it was time. Um, there were a lot of other, you know, they had parking issues. The park, the parking lot had closed down. It was just a lot of other things that went into it. And we just decided it was time in 2009. Um, so the we decided to so lots of things. I was about ready. I felt like I had, um, I was losing my momentum at some point as a business owner. My husband always has said, you need to work on your business and not just in your business. Mm -hmm. And I really Great. started out so strong working on the business and in the business. And then as life happened and things change, I find myself working more in the business and not on the business. And I knew that was kind of your tall tale of maybe it's, it's time um, to do something else. And uh, my husband was expanding his business and we'd be traveling a lot more. And I, we just felt like with a 13 and a 14 year old at home, well, at the time it was 12 and 13, it was probably time for me to be around a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And with him traveling that we just didn't have a lot of options. So we decided um, it was time on our terms and found a restaurant broker and, um, Sold it in November of 2021. 
Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. And since then, you've been a professional bruncher. I did say that. <laughs> I did make that up. I did. I did. My husband, like you asked the question about, you know, how do you stop being an entrepreneur when you're, you know, you're daily, that's what you're focusing on is, you know, keep the restaurant going and keep your, you know, we had obviously everyone's talked about COVID and a restaurant was a hard thing to own in COVID. And just to touch on that really quick is because we were so community based and that we gave back to the community and they gave to us when that time was closed, we had to close twice because we were the sixth license. We had people coming in to donate to our staff. Wow. Thousands of, I shouldn't say that, you know, how much <laughs> people came in and wanted to ensure that all of the people that worked wow. for us were taken care of. So when we would sell to go food, they would give, um, their credit card tips were double the amount. Wow. And at some point, um, everything that they gave went back to them. We didn't take anything. We, they weren't working. And we calculated by how many hours, you know, pretty much we just said, like, you work five shifts a week and you work two shifts a week. We calculated it just to make sure you were getting something for the amount you were losing. And wow. that just shows you, like, the community came in so hard to support us. It was, it was awesome. Yeah. So when you started up after COVID, at least uh, when you started up for real and not, you know, stop and not start. Not the fake time. <laughs> yeah. Um, did, how did you keep, or maybe it's, maybe it's a question of, did your employees all come back? Everybody but one. And okay. she moved out of state with her okay. for work for, wow. with her husband. Because that's unusual. It I is. mean, like in that time, I remember like, that was a big problem. A lot of the owners were like, I can't get good people yeah. anymore. It I don't have any unusual. kitchen help. I have to yeah. close yeah. the kitchen down yep. today. And we ended yeah. up paying, we continued to pay the kitchen. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Even when we were, when we weren't having sales come in. And when it was to-go food, it was easier to do that. But yeah. we knew that kitchen, I mean, any restaurant yeah. is looking for kitchen. We could not lose my art. We have the most amazing people back there. Yeah. And they're truly friends. And I need to make sure that they're taken care of and that they want to come back and can come back. So that was that was a tough one. But they all came back um, little by little. You know, you had you didn't have that much business at first and it slowly people started to get more comfortable. So did you pay the kitchen their full salary or mm-hmm. so did you set aside money for that or it was tied into COVID money? And tied, stuff too? We knew that would happen. It was tied into COVID money. Okay. And ultimately, um, some of it came out of our pocket to mm-hmm. make sure that they... Um, we're okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think them coming back uh, shows the culture that you built, you know, because <laughs> if they weren't, you know, excited to come back, then some of them probably wouldn't yeah. have. Yeah. yeah. And they were loyal to, um, to not just me, they were loyal to, yeah. you know, CKs and the brand and a side funny story, just a real quick funny story. Somewhere around the 17 and a half years we had the Awatuki Little League <clears throat> went to the state championship. We were full. We were doing an Awatuki Little League fundraiser, and the power goes out. And um, power went back on, and our fryers went out. So for some reason, we had no fryers. Yeah. So I have a restaurant full of people. We have no fryers. We have all these tickets. And that kind of goes with the whole, you know, not getting overwhelmed, not getting, you know. And these, these guys back there figured out a way to just the fryers are out to put all this oil on the stove top and get the tickets out wow. to they knew they saw my face and they figured out how to at least get the tickets that were in get these people out the door and and yeah. it was just, just just that's my point is that's these are the people these are mm-hmm. these are the um the amazing employees over the years for sure so cool yeah, here, I have a I, special place in my heart for them. You know, it, it reminds me, we have a lot of students who come to us from China and from India and from all over the world, and our Indian students taught me a term they use over there called Jugad, where they, it's basically they hack it. <laughs> it's like if you don't <laughs> figure have, it out. Yeah, so you're... <laughs> like uh, a MacGyver, yeah, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. So we call it the MacGyver. Yeah. I call it the hool. If I ever want to create a <laughs> shortcut and do something most efficiently, yeah. I just uh, hoolist it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to say, he when you talked about cheers, he's your norm. <laughs> <laughs> he's the guy probably at your bar drinking beer every day. Right? So for those of you listening to this, he's actually referring to Isaac, not, not me. Uh, 
So Aspen, uh, obviously you're in the hospitality domain uh, yeah. with your startup. Um, I'm curious your reaction to, to Kendra's journey. Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Yeah. It's really encouraging for uh-huh. me because I'm 26 and I started my company on my 26th birthday. Wow. That was my you know, whole goal in uh, that stage of my life. And it's interesting for me hearing how your family was in restaurants and I... You know, my my parents, I also respect them so much for what they've already done. And maintaining that healthy mindset with, you know, passing that baton to the next generation and how you handled that as 26, starting a business um, with your brother, you know, any sort of pressure or expectation you kind of had. And then now as a mother, uh, how have you passed that on to your kids in a healthy way? Um, Because I want to be a mother one day, too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think there's a certain way uh, to do that right and a certain way to, you know, put too much pressure. Sure, Um, yeah. So I'd love to hear more about that. They they were actually super disappointed when we sold it because they both had always dreamed about working in the restaurant. And Your I, kids? Yeah. Wow. I had I a lot. You were sorry. I know, me too. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. I went backwards and did the kids first. Um, they, were, they were disappointed because at some point they were a part of it. Yeah. And um, I felt that when they came in, everybody loved to talk to them and they... But I had jokes with some of the employees that are like, if 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 Gavin or Campbell work here or become our manager, I feel like I've been here too long. I need to go. I have people that have <laughs> said that all the time. But um, my parents have always instilled hard work. Yeah. And um, when they opened the restaurants, they knew that, you know, Chad and I, hard work and our business, de- Chad mm-hmm. also is an ASU graduate. Okay. And so our, our degrees and our um, experiences and our hard work would get us there. My mom, she didn't, she was, she's not a big operations person. She doesn't, she got nervous if she went to the restaurant. My dad loved being there and talking to everybody. And so she does the, she does the bookkeeping for Tortilla Factory. And then she taught me to do the bookkeeping for CK. So um, they handed that down and the, the importance of, you know, ethics and, and hard work and that kind of thing. And then we hopefully push that down to our kids, but they saw it. They saw, you know, and they see, they see the, uh, the parents, you know, all of us going into work and working hard. And, you know, even during the day, to, like now, I'm not working anymore, but mm-hmm. I'm still giving back. I'm, I do a lot of volunteer um, things, and I'm also just payroll processing for my husband's company because I wanted to keep doing something. And when I'm home, I can do that from home. But that just shows there, like, I'm not just brunching. <laughs> I'm not just professional brunching where I told he's like what have you been up to I'm like brunching <laughs> at first I did after yeah. all that time um you know people have longer careers but I just felt like that was um I you know I was going to take some time to brunch and now um showing the kids that you know you can still just because I don't have CKs anymore doesn't mm-hmm. mean I'm not valuable to them and the community and the things that I'm doing so I think that's also, you know, equally an important lesson. You know, you can be devout to your work and all the different things, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's something that you do move on from eventually. So I think that that's such a great inspiration from, you know, someone who will eventually exit as well. Yep, and now, and that's, you know, you you do, it's a business, you know, you do need an exit strategy. At some point, when you start your business, you also need to understand what what is your exit strategy. And um, like you said, you already... You know you will be eventually, so hopefully not for too long. Nope, not yeah. you got some time. You got some time. So I'm I'm glad you brought up the exit piece because I think at least in the way that we're training most of our entrepreneurs <clears throat> at ASU, ASU is a big place for a global institution. So one of our mantras is impact at scale. And so when we work with startup founders, it's like okay, yeah, we have to serve this initial group of of customers in the neighborhood, but if we create value for them. How big can we take this? Can we go, you know, in the Southwest? Can we go nationally? Can we go internationally? So I know these two founders are thinking about scale. Yeah. I'm and curious, when you were in kind of the middle part of your restaurant ownership career, um, one of my favorite books in the, in the world of kind of Main Street uh, business operation is E-Myth. I don't know if, you've, if you're familiar with it. It's an author named Michael Gerber. And it, it, it's funny, he had a a little bit of a different take on your uh, quote, the great quote you gave, uh, you can either work on your business or in your business, and you did both. And I, did, I did better in than on. But <laughs> that you did better in than, than on. Is yeah, that's where yeah. I feel like I could have done better. That's where I... I see. Yeah, yeah. so his, his kind of um, 
tutelage for uh, kind of Main Street business owners is to think as a owner rather than a craftsperson. Yeah. And it sounded like your craft was just being so good with the employees and with the customers that, you know, um, did you ever think about franchising CKs as a, as a means of scaling your secret sauce, which I don't know if you can separate the uh-huh. two, right? We talked about it. It was a discussion that we had, and I wasn't all in. Like I said, at some point when I said I was, I was really good at in and on the business at the beginning, and then as it got later and life happened and the kids and that kind of thing, I found myself working more in the business. That's why I said it was it was um, definitely something I knew I could improve on towards the end, um, but I just wasn't. I wasn't that was. You need to scale your business to grow. Like if yeah. that's how you, that's business. I mean, right? You start here and you go here. I just wasn't willing to put in that that time and away from the kids, and that was kind of where I started to go the other direction. Mm-hmm. So I knew I was on my way out. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting <laughs> thing um, that a lot of early stage companies feel compelled to raise capital and to grow fast and all that stuff. But, you know, it's perfectly fine if you don't want to do that. If you want to grow slower and just do it with internal money, as long as you're still successful and you define your own success, right? You don't have to explode. You can you can continue to grow and not necessarily go that route. Because there's a lot of downside to, to growth, yeah. too. Yeah. It, it's, a lot, it's a lot of pain. Yeah. <laughs> and you focus on building your sales and building, you know, yeah. profit and building that. But again, you have this much space and that's, yeah. that's all you have. So you hit your limit. Mm-hmm. And if you don't want to scale your business, that's where your limit is. And I think that's half the reason where too, like we, you know, we hit our limit and, you know, we had our highest sales and, um, it was, it was time. And over that time I had some health problems and I had, you know, just ups and downs of valleys and stuff. And so, um, 2018, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and so I spent a good year and a half dealing with that, wow. which was lucky for me that um, the staff just picked up for me, and they put in the extra time, and that was, you know, all the ups and downs of everything that any breast, any business owner goes through, but I felt like that's also why it was time for me to spend some time with the kids and, and be done. Yeah, and you beat cancer. Yes, I did. Almost five. It'll be five years coming up. So this year's so, five years. Oh, my gosh. I'm so happy. <laughs> she, she's a, one of my oldest friends. So it, that, so great to hear that, Kendra. And um, Yeah, it's great for these two of our uh, cohort of entrepreneurs to hear this particular story. So Sounds what like else you have you a get, very cool got? road ahead of you guys. And, and real, yeah. as we go into the, you know, uh, wrap up some Q&A, uh, Michael, you mentioned you work with clients that, that run businesses similar to CKs. Yeah. Well, I've been practicing a long time. So um, I've been practicing for 30, going on 35 years. Um, so I've seen a You've lot seen of a lot. companies. <laughs> and uh, over the years, um, it, it kind of doesn't matter what type of business, but most of my best clients are people that I started with early and they've gone on to success. You develop a relationship with them that they start to trust you a lot. And then when they get successful and sell their companies, if they do anything else, they come back and they tell their friends about you and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so we've had a handful. I mean, I've had restaurants that franchise that became corporate with multiple locations that, you know, smaller uh, owners that just, you know, had successful individual restaurants and sold them. My next door neighbor's a restaurateur. So I'm into the foodie world with, with them. So. All right. Is that uh, is that Joe? Joe, yeah, Joe Johnson. So um, he's the he's the uh, real mayor bar- of Gilbert, the <laughs> official mayor of Gilbert, I believe. <laughs> so okay, cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know Joe personally, but sorry, I, um, I don't want to. Uh... Anyway, so like I don't I'm not sure what the, what the, what you want me to say about it, but um, yeah, I I think you know. Within the restaurant industry, there's certain things that you've brought out already in your conversation that are um, a little bit different than other types of businesses. Um, like you have to work your butt off and sweat a lot. And, <laughs> and there's a lot of risk in the beginning and making sure your pricing is right and all these kind of things. Um, 
that are a little different than other types of businesses. So, um, but I think what you've demonstrated is you picked up skills in other environments like at Intel and other places that when you have those skills, you can apply them across almost any mm -hmm. business. For sure. And that's one thing we talk a lot about with people that are in the military that go on to start companies. If you do things in the military, you learn to think on your feet. And, you, and like, you know, you talk about the moment when your fryers are down and stuff like that. Well, that's what the military does every day when they're out there. <laughs> and they're like, out. they're solving problems. <laughs> they're like, how do, I, how do I do this? It's not working. This thing's screwed up. We still have to accomplish our mission. So I think some of those skills transfer greatly to the business mm -hmm. world because you have to face things like that. So anyway, it's a really good, get too far off. No, that's a really good point, Michael. <laughs> I'm glad you brought it up because both Isaac and Aspen – are drawing from their prior experience, as you heard in their introduction. So maybe you guys can speak to that uh, yeah. a little bit, because Aspen, you had uh, <laughs> a, a roller coaster in the <laughs> early part of your career yeah, uh, that did. is now influencing what you're doing for your company. Yeah, definitely. So I worked for the only other that I know of, tech-centric entertainment firm, for three years, and I feel like I truly grew up in that company, mm -hmm. and I'm very grateful for that company. Uh, unfortunately, it did go under in August of 2022. And at that same time, I was really, I had enough in my savings. I didn't know if I was going to, you know, truly go all in on Gatsby's. And I was really thinking about it. It was really bothering me. And a month later, everything that happened, happened. And it was the best thing that, you know, personally could have happened to me. Of course, I feel, you know, devastated for the company that I worked for. Um, but I got to work alongside the CEO for a year. And I was his assistant. And so I got a crash course in you know, mid-stage uh, <laughs> startups. Uh, crash course and crash. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> what not to that do. Little bit. You know, I, I do respect him a ton. You know, things yeah. happen. Um, but, yeah, I'm very, very grateful. At the time, I didn't, you know, always think that way. But looking back, um, sure. I know that the leadership skills I was taught and all the different ways to maneuver, maneuver both bad and good mm -hmm. um, will serve me well. Um, and, yeah, that was kind and of... It's good that you mentioned a failure. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I can call it a failure from the outside. I don't know if you'd call it that. You, you could also yeah. say we had that, that, that company had an exit. Yeah, so my first true. company had an exit. So now, I'm, now I'm moving on to the next thing. It's yeah. like, yeah, well, it was a bankruptcy. Yeah. Um, but but um, <clears throat> most gurus that I know in the business world... Um, and venture capitalists, mm -hmm. they say the um, your your knowledge of failures is a huge asset going yeah. forward because yeah. you're going to learn so much by yes. if right. you're yes. in them. As long as you have the spirit that yeah. you know we're going to we're going to persist and do yeah. something else. But it, even if you're just observing them, like yeah. you can you can you know incorporate that information yeah. into whatever you're going to do in the future. Exactly, and I think it really specifically ingrained the kind of leader I'm going to be. Because, you know, not to say the <clears throat> people I was working under were bad people by any means. A lot of them were incredible people. But they were just making decisions that if I were in their shoes, I wouldn't have made. Mm -hmm. And so operating under a person like that for a year uh, really, 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 you know, leaves a deep remembrance. And for now sure. that I get to, you know, step into those shoes in a very small scale, but eventually, you know, with those getting bigger, it's something mm -hmm. that I'll carry with me. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful for it. That's great. So just like Intel is a, uh, a fantastic partner for us at ASU, they took you on uh, right out of uh, B school. Uh, sure Isaac did. being with uh, Starbucks, yeah. uh, you know, Starbucks is a, a, a fantastic collaborator for us here at the university. So do you have a similar kind of uh, yeah, I mean, aha moment in your uh, Yeah, corporate? I definitely wouldn't be or have started the product or anything like that without working at Starbucks because that's what introduced me to the problem. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to find a solution for that problem. And so, um, yeah, I definitely wouldn't have started anything without ASU, both because they paid for my tuition to ASU <laughs> for my undergrad, yeah. which introduced me to the MSIVD program and also the problem statement that I'm looking to solve. So, yeah. Who's your customer going to be? Right directly to consumer, or are you going to sell to other like yeah, Starbucks? Yeah, so initially it was supposed to be like a, a product for consumers at home to bring the cafe experience home. Um, but since then, I've kind of pivoted to focus on B2B, just as a lower barrier to entry for me. Um, and I've already connected with a lot of cafe owners in both Arizona and Washington State, which is where I'm from. Yeah. Um, and so I, I eventually definitely want to move into that uh, B2C model, but. Initially, we're focused on B2B. 
I will be your first customer. Yeah. As I said from the get-go. Yeah. <laughs> you will. I'm sure you have a lot of people ready. Yeah. To no, they are. Yeah. I'm just to use your product. Working, working on that that recipe. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, so um, last opportunity here, we're running out of time. Um, Want to defer to these these two amazing students, and you can pass if you want to, but we have <laughs> uh, an amazing brain trust here with Michael Houle and Kendra Flom Parat. So thank you both for being here. Any any last questions for these two brainiacs from uh, our, our youngest founders uh, yeah. in the room? Yeah, do you think that your experience, because, you know, my Starbucks helped a lot with, where I'm, what I built my business into. Um, do you think your experience working in a restaurant, like, kind of motivated you to, to start it, or like, how did that? It gave me more confidence yeah, okay. because, like yeah. I said, my my family had already had the two, but if I had never stepped foot in there, I wouldn't have had the confidence. Yeah. To I wouldn't have the knowledge, right? And that's, you kind of stumble upon your passion, and you stumble upon <clears throat> something that you you find that you're good at by accident. That's a lot of the times what happens and everyone says, get a job at a restaurant. I'm like, okay, why not? And that's where I felt like I thrived a little bit more and I loved the hustle and bustle and I loved talking to people and yeah. that kind of thing. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, plus I, I feel like that probably helped you create that culture because you were in those shoes before. Mm-hmm. So you know like what they're, yeah. you know, how they feel and yeah. what they, what you wanted for management when you were in their shoes is I imagine help develop you as a, a leader for sure just like i think you working at starbucks will be invaluable to yeah. you for all aspects of your business yeah definitely mm-hmm. aspen anything else before we wrap? yeah i think uh just generally between all three of you i guess um with the financial markets and everything that we're seeing today what general advice and you know encouragement would you give you know to young founders that are going into a time like this since you guys have seen them before us um, you don't have to get specific, but just kind of generally what, what words of encouragement or advice would you give? Well, I, I, <laughs> that one on you. I well I've, I've lived through a lot of cycles, yeah. and yeah. Uh, I've learned a lot from entrepreneurs. Um, in fact, the interesting thing about what I do is um, I give advice, and I tell them what to do, and they listen to me you know, half the time. That sounds about right. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> Because they're the risk takers, yeah. right? I don't have to take the risk. They take the risk. So yeah. it's whatever they are comfortable with, they'll take a risk. Mm-hmm. That's what business is all about. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I'd say is, what I've learned is, when the market is bad, that's incredible opportunity if you look mm-hmm. at it the right way. Yeah. So great companies have started out of bad environments. So if you can, if you can like get going when the market is bad, when it picks up again, you're going to have a lot of wind at your sails. So awesome. it's a good time to start a company mm-hmm. because you'll be ahead of the people that are trying to start up when they're when they're when there's money flowing and mm-hmm. stuff. So you just have to figure out how to eke it out mm-hmm. when they're in the downtime and survive, mm-hmm. but keep your vision and just be there when the when things turn around and you'll you'll scale a lot faster. So that's yeah. my advice. So instead of buying the expensive fryer, just uh, pour some, <laughs> some oil over yeah, the grill. Just, yeah, yeah, just find someone that's can MacGyver it, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Thank you. That was great advice. Yeah, great question. Yeah, and I'm, uh, just just to piggyback off of that, I mean, you it's you had an experience with traditional bankers, so I think if I if I can kind of glean into knowing where Aspen's coming from, she's raising, you know, venture capital potentially, <clears> which, <throat> which is different from the money mm-hmm. that you and and Chad and the rest of the family kind of went after. Um, so any tips for folks that might be looking to get bank uh, loans for a traditional kind of more steady state business plan that I'm assuming you all put together? Um, no, not really recommendations as much as just have your ducks in a row and and make sure, like I said earlier, have that excess capital for unforeseen circumstances and for um, don't just get the minimum that you need. Um, mm-hmm. But they also take in the history of, you know, my father's work experience and the two restaurants previous to mm-hmm. that that were successful. It helps. So mm-hmm. in general, I don't have much recommendations for you there other than, you know, don't sell yourself short. Like, know you're going to know you're going to expand and be big, dream big. And, um, you know, don't just settle for the little that you think. Go for it all for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. And one thing I'd say with with the type of money you're looking to raise Mm -hmm. Um, Because I work a lot with investors and they say this is a great time to be an investor. Mm -hmm. Not just that, you know, 
um, I could take advantage of, you know, people that are desperate. But, <laughs> but, but it's just that entrepreneurs, like, they, they're, when the cycle is really good and money's flowing, it gets real frothy and people have bad expectations mm -hmm. and, and unrealistic valuations and all kinds of things. But when the market turns, it cleans all that out mm -hmm. and, the, and the businesses get real. And they start talking about cash flow, customers, all that kind of stuff. Um, so as an investor, you can evaluate businesses much more rationally. So what I'd say is when you're talking to investors, um, don't give them a lot of puff. Think of the, like, mm -hmm. you know, um, just the basics that that a rational business would be looking at to measure things and stuff and, and have a plan to tell them you know, why you're, you're good and how you're going to grow that. Mm -hmm. Cause right now is it, that's what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. Right. So, cause everything gets down to the basics when the market's bad. Mm -hmm. So just focus on those, you know, and bring it up as an asset. <clears throat> you have done this a long time. Haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. I, I took one it. of his classes. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah. I loved that class. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And he's an inspiration to many of our students. So uh, thank you, Michael, for being here as always. You're welcome. I enjoy it. Really appreciate it. And uh, Kendra. Thank you for having me. It's been an absolute honor for you to join us here on nice campus. nice to be in a room with you, Mr. Siebel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're hilarious. Uh, it's great to reconnect. And, of course, our, our two amazing founders from our MSWD program. Thank, thank you both for being here. Thanks for having us. Appreciate your time. <laughs> All right, everyone, uh, we'll see you next time on how we innovate at Arizona State University. Go Devils.